Well, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Pedro Domingos uh, joining us in the University of Washington, uh, computer scientist, engineer, long, illustrious career in AI, starting before it was uh, <laughs> something everyone did. Uh, and so he's here to talk to us about how, how uh, will AI change ethics. So thanks. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction and then thanks for bringing me here. And I hope this will be uh, interesting and, and thought provoking for you. And uh, here's the idea of this of this talk. As you've probably noticed, AI ethics is very much not just on academics' mind, but on everybody's mind these days. Right? AI is becoming more and more powerful, and there's a host of ethical issues that it raises. So it's good that there's a lot of attention being paid to AI ethics, but on the other hand, there's there's something that I think is a little unfortunate, which is almost all the work that I Shoehorn AI into our existing ethical norms, right? And the reason this is unfortunate is that, um, wait a second here, oops, it's a two way street, right? We can't just change AI to conform to our ethical norms. The interaction between technology and society goes in both directions. Techno society, of course, does and should influence technology, but, uh, but technology also brings about social change. And in particular, new technologies change people's idea of what's moral and what isn't. So to take you know, a very simple example, look at the pill, right? That one particular invention dramatically changed sexual mores. Or, or you know, here's another example. Think of the printing press, right? You know, I can imagine Catholic clergy talking at the time that the printing press was invented, saying like, oh yeah, this is a great invention. It's going to save scribes a lot of time, but we have to make sure it doesn't fall into the hands of the lay people, because you know, who knows what that might cause, right? Well, guess what? It did fall into the hands of the lay people, uh, which brought about the Reformation and decades of, of, of wars, and then full societies like America that were built on Protestant principles instead of Catholic ones, right? And we're just talking about the printing press, right? Now, AI, if you believe, for example, Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Google, AI is more profound than electricity or fire. And indeed, he's recently burned his fingers with it. But, uh, you know, so one, you could look at it and say, like, well, this is a wild exaggeration. Right? On the other hand, indeed, it isn't a wild exaggeration. But either way, it behooves us, right, to think, well, if AI is going to be such a profound change, and we look at previous technologies and how they change society, what is going to happen with AI, right? Like, we can't work on this assumption that, like, which is the assumption that we seem to be working on, that, like, society is going to stay just the same, right? Nothing is going to change about what we think is moral and isn't and etc. It's just that, you know, we're going to plug AI into that. I'm sorry, but that is not the way it's going to pan out if you judge by any major technology of the past, let alone something of the potential order of magnitude of AI, right? AI is not going to leave morality and change. So the exercise that I would like to propose is that we spend a little bit of time thinking how, you know, Think back 50 or 100 years, right? And then and, 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 and think, for example, of actually start now and look at us looking at the people of the 19th century, right? And we go like, oh my God, how could they have been so racist and sexist and whatnot, right? Like it's hard to understand. Well, the people of 50 or 100 years from now are probably going to be thinking exactly that about us. The question is in what regard? Right? And obviously one of the things that brings that change about is technology, not the only one, but technology is clearly a big one. So it behooves us to try and like do that exercise of saying like, where are things headed and, and, and how can we influence them, right? And like, you know, what are good versus bad things to do, right? Instead of just sort of like letting things go on a certain track because we never even thought about this problem. Now, of course, 
This is not easy to do at all. One of the main reasons it's not easy to do is that we believe so strongly in our moral principles, whatever they are, and they could be very different right, than they are, that we can't even imagine the counter to that, a world in which those are not the moral principles or, or, or a world that works in a different way. But we have to overcome that barrier and try to think, right? what, what, do you, what is a world in which AI is pervasive you know, bottom to you know, top to bottom and left to right. And what what's the kind of moral thinking that people do in that world, right? Now, the the other side of this is that AI, as new technology, has this feature that is both amazing and um, maybe perverse in some ways, which is that AI is the ultimate horizontal technology. Right? It's like you can use it for anything. It's the automation of intelligence. And what that means is that so that, in a way, is, is, is exciting because it means, you know, it has the potential to do a lot of good, right? But it also means that everybody gets to project onto AI whatever worries them, right? AI is like a blank AI is like a Rorschach test, right? Whatever is on your mind, you will project onto it because I guarantee you there's a way to do that with AI. There might not be a way to do it with electricity or, you know, with, with some other areas of science and whatnot, like, you know, climate, sociology, like with AI, whatever worries you, you get to put your confidence. So, for example, uh, and, and, and by the way, one, one of the things that's unfortunate about sort of like the current literature and debate on AI ethics is that it's almost entirely driven by middle class, liberal, Western, intellectual, blah, 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 which are a tiny fraction of the world, right? Why should AI, you know, obey the particular, you know, moral, you know, beliefs of that segment of the population, even if it's mine, right? So, for example, we in the West, you know, we grew up on the Bible and Genesis directly or indirectly, and we are very obsessed with this notion of the creation rebelling against the creator, right? It goes all the way to the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve, and then there's, you know, the Frankenstein, you know, monster, and like, and we're very, I mean, if you look at a lot of, sort of like the press coverage about AI, it's all about Skynet, right? And they're going to take over and kill all of us, and oh my God, the apocalypse is coming. Meanwhile, in Japan, right, where they're more influenced by the Shinto religion, they just see robots as friendly creatures that, you know, that we'll work with and, and treat them accordingly. And not coincidentally, Japan is arguably the country in the world that is farthest along in robotics, more advanced than America, for example, more advanced than China, Europe, et cetera, et cetera, right? You know, here's another example, right, closer to home. For liberals, right, liberals care a lot about fairness and equality and whatnot. So liberals look at the AI and they see a cesspool of bias and discrimination, okay? If the algorithms discriminate, the algorithms perpetuate biases, et cetera, et cetera. Libertarians, on the other hand, are very concerned with freedom. And what they see in AI before anything else is the danger of this being the next big brother. Now, just to be clear, it's not that these are not valid concerns. These are all valid concerns. Okay? So I'm not dismissing them. Let me make that very clear. But those concerns are only a small sliver of the whole picture. And also the people with their various, you know, uh, uh, preconceptions come at them with a very partial, and often distorted view of what's going to happen with the AI, which is typically influenced by what their experience with humans has been. And AI and humans are different things, and that's really central to, to the problem that we're dealing with here. So, okay, let's do this exercise of trying to, to, to speculate ahead at what the people of 50 to 100 years from now will think of AI and you know and, and, and the, the morality of the various issues surrounding AI. And what I'm gonna do here is just, just go through a few of them, each of them briefly, each of them we could easily have a whole talk on. But let's do that exercise in the spirit of like, I'm not saying this is what is going to happen because I don't have a crystal ball. I'm not even saying, you know, it's what should happen. I'm just saying we need to think about these kinds of things, right? And we're not going to do it in a vacuum, right? We can do it inspired by our knowledge of history and economics and sociology, right? It's like Churchill said, you know, you can predict, you can see farther ahead by looking further back, right? So like we, we should, you know, and we have a lot of data to draw on in terms of like what has happened with technology in the society of the past to try and do this exercise. So let's start with uh, privacy, okay? 
and data sharing, because I think that actually the better way to think about the issue is in terms of data sharing, not privacy. Privacy already presupposes that your goal is to withhold your data. When I think that your goal is, should be, or would be better be like to make optimal use of your data, which in some cases may mean withholding, but in other cases may not mean withholding. So, uh, and in each of these cases, I'm going to contrast what we think now, which of course will be, you know, like the cartoon picture of reality, but hopefully one that captures something with how things might look in the future, right? So for example, right now we have this belief, at least in the West, and again, this does vary by culture, that privacy is a right. We have the right to privacy. In particular in Europe, it's written into the constitution that privacy is a fundamental right of everybody. And Europe has passed laws like GDPR and there's a whole series of other, you know, the AI Act and the Data Services Act and the Data Blah 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 Act, all, you know, among other things, implementing this right to privacy. Okay? Now, you know, the, the, the interesting thing about this is that privacy historically is a fairly recent invention, right? You, you won't find the word privacy in like, you know, 18th century manuscripts. Right? And there was no privacy in the tribe and the village. And in fact, some would say that there's no privacy in the global village either, and you should just get over it. There's actually a famous quote from Scott McNeil, CEO of Sun, is like, you don't have any, get over it. Right? So, and, and the people who, you know, if you look at this, the people who promoted the notion of privacy were mostly politicians and people in the public sphere who felt that they needed to protect their private lives. The regular people, for the most part, never knew or cared about privacy. And there's another very relevant to what we're trying to do here, you know, which you may have noticed, big difference, which is a generational difference in attitudes to privacy. People above a certain age, you know, like they think all this social media stuff and data mining and whatnot is just awful. And, you know, if you could just stop the whole thing, you know, the world would be a better place. People from, you know, below a certain age, they're like, yeah, they, they live their lives in public. They post everything on social media they don't want to withhold their data the more people who see their private lives and the finest details of the like the ideal world is like everybody's following every last detail of what i do from the morning to the night and i'm the most famous person on earth it's like the anti-privacy so there's this risk that we're having this big discussion on privacy and laws passed about privacy in europe and california thankfully not texas so far and so on you know with the notion of privacy that the people you know you know, already alive today, just don't care about. It's not what their, you know, understanding of privacy is or, or, or what it should be. Now, to dig down just, you know, one, one level, people are very concerned with the following phenomenon. Tech companies, you know, like the Googles, the Facebooks of this world, they mine this data, uh, they, uh, they understand you and they use it to manipulate you, okay? If you're not, the, if the product is free, you're the product, right? You probably heard the same, right? And the, so a couple of things. One of them is, 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 is this. Life is not a zero sum game, right? This kind of thinking where if, you, if the product is free or the product is zero sum thinking. In reality, when you look at what happens with, you know, these platforms that do target advertising and whatnot, what is being played is a non-zero game where all the players benefit. Google benefits, you benefit, the advertiser benefits, and the site, right, providing the content, the blogger, the whatever, the, you know, the podcaster also benefits. So, so very concretely, let's let's try to quantify this a little bit just to get a sense of what's going going on here. What is in this non-zero sum game? What is your value to Google? Right, the average, the value to Google, the average user is the Google, you know, revenue, yearly revenue divided by the, by the number of users. And that turns out to be in the tens of dollars. So you are worth tens of dollars to Google per year. Okay, congratulations. Now, there was this survey done by folks at MIT a couple of years ago where they, you know, this was good, they, they elicited what is the value, the details are not relevant, but we could go into them. What is the value to you or for example, using the Google search engine. Okay, this is for various things, but the search engine is one good example. You know, care to guess? The value of using Google to the average user is $17,000 per year. Meaning, Google is worth to you orders of magnitude more than you are worth to it. 
It's not that when the product is free, you're the product, right? It's a non-zero-sum game. You're actually gaining way more from the Google search engine than the Google search engine is gaining from you, okay? So maybe what you want to do is not withhold your data, is to make sure that the data used in ways that you like, because of course it could also be used, be used in ways that you don't like, and whether you trust or don't trust the entities, companies or not, or governments that are using the data. So for example, there are these rankings of how much people in America trust different institutions, and two of the top three in the last 10 years are Google and Amazon. People trust Google and Amazon more than the government, more than the police, more than the media, more than almost everything. Way at the other side of the scale, on the bottom, you know, almost as bad as politicians and journalists, I'm not kidding, is Facebook. Because, you know, if you know the history, Amazon and Google were always very mindful about doing things that, you know, are good for the user, whereas Facebook was very cavalier in ways that, you know, it has lost our trust and will never regain it, right? So this, I think, is maybe the way that you want to think about it, like, who do you want to have access to your data and how, such that you get used to your benefit? But withholding your data is like doing what the Amish do. It's like, you know, they're entitled to not like technology, but what fraction of the world is Amish? Almost nothing, right? And it's going to be the same thing with, with data sharing. Like, like data sharing, I would say, 50 years from now, is going to look like putting money in the bank, right? Remember when people didn't put the money in the bank and they kept it under the mattress because the, the, the bank might steal your money, right? It's actually a perfectly natural human reaction, right? But now, of course, it's laughable. And I think it's very similar with data. It's like, you know, like, why are, we, why are you keeping your data under the mattress, right? Give it to the organizations that will invest in your behalf. Now, why does the bank not run away with your money? Because it, on balance, it would be a loss for them. So it's not clear whether, for example, the Googles and the Facebooks are the right organizations to entrust your data and modeling you with. My guess is that they aren't, right? But that's the kind of debate that we want to be having, not the debate like, you know, and we can organize ourselves. We can create data unions if you're left-wing. You can create data banks, right, if you're more, you know, market-oriented. But, like, that's what you want to be thinking about. And the people who do that with their data will do much better in every way than the ones who keep their data on the mattress. And then there's another aspect of this, which again is extremely important, but I see getting almost no airplay in either the research community or, or, or the media or politics, which is there is also a social, in many cases, there's a social and ethical duty to share your data. So for example, I've, 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 I've heard cancer researchers say that with enough data, we can cure cancer. We, because we can do the models of metabolic networks and gene regulation and blah, 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 that will ask you cancer. And without enough data, we can't. And, and you know, I've heard, for example, one of them said, like, the biggest barriers to get all the hospitals and patients or what to actually share the data that can then be, you know, uh, 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 mined for this purpose. Now, if you think about it that way, if you are a cancer patient, it is your ethical duty to share the data from your, from your uh, tumor. Okay? And also in your self-interest, because your cancer might recur or your relatives might get it. And like, if in the meantime, we've gotten better at finding that cancer, you know, you've gained yourself. But more, more generally, you have a social duty to do that. And of course, cancer is just one example. The entire, you know, healthcare system from top to bottom, left to right, can be improved with better machine learning. And, you know, think of social science, right? Like, we actually are at an amazing point in history where for the first time, Social science potentially has an amount of data commensurate with the problems that it's studying, right? Physics took off before the other sciences because it studies the simplest phenomena, right? You know, I, I'm, I'm Galileo, you know, I roll some balls on an inclined plane, right? Social science is of a different order of complexity, but now we actually have potentially data to understand those phenomena better and then consequently make better decisions, right? You know, evidence-based policy is better policy, but you can't have evidence-based policy without the evidence. Right? So I think what's going to happen down the line is sort of like this whole data economy and, and you know, data society becomes normalized is that if you live in a data-rich society and you withhold your data, you will be seen as a freeloader and you will be penalized accordingly. Okay? So maybe this is the future that we're heading towards and as you can see, it is dramatically different from the future that is, you know, being envisaged in all these, you know, discussions and laws and regulations and then policies that, that is, you know, and books being written or not that, that you see being, uh, you know, uh, talked about today. So here's another one. 
probably in terms of you know uh, public and research focus, the, the biggest one of all of these, right? Which is fairness and equality. Right. I mean, there's like the, the number of papers talking about how machine learning algorithms are biased and perpetuate biases, and I mean, like it's 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 um, you know never ending. The thing that I mean, I have you know colleagues that do this for a living, you know, uh, whom I respect and whatnot, teach classes on this and whatnot. But for example, these classes often have a lot of things on like different ways to modify machine learning algorithms to debias them. What they never question is the goal that is being served here. Why do I need the machine learning algorithms to be modified in this way? Is that a good thing to do? And again, depending on your position in the political spectrum, you may think this is a good thing to do or not, right? So even, even today, right, even just looking at today. So, you know, we could have easily a whole talk about this, but let me just pick one thing to, to make it concrete. Today, we have on the books a lot of laws that forbid the use of some kinds of information. For example, you can't use race and gender in things like credit scoring, uh, you know, hiring, uh, uh, sentencing, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And, and if you think about it, this is actually a little odd in some ways because it goes against one of the basic tenets of rational decision making, which is that you should make your decisions based on all the available evidence. If your decisions are not based on all the available evidence, they are, you know, they may be the wrong decision, right? Which is irrational, number one, and then and also arguably unethical, right? Why are you making the wrong decision? Okay. Now, the 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 reason the, now you can say like, oh. The reason you know these laws exist is that that information is irrelevant to the decision. Race and gender are not relevant to credit scoring or whatever. But whether or not they're relevant is an empirical question. And empirical questions can't be decided by law, right? Like Congress can tell me what is empirical true or not, right? You can't derive a not from an is, and not, but conversely, you can't derive an is from an ought, which is actually what's going on in some of this. Right? Now, I think that the real reason behind this is that these laws were made with human beings in mind. Right? When people passed you know, all these laws, typically in the 60s, in the case of the United States, right, the, the Civil Rights you know, Act, et cetera, et cetera, like, it was assumed that human beings have all these biases, and we need these laws to tamp down on them. But we are now in a new world where a lot of these decisions are made by algorithms, and so now the question of whether there is this ingrained prejudice needs to be revisited. Because an algorithm is very different from a human being. One of the fallacies that people are always committing in looking at AI, even experts, but particularly so like the late public, is, is what we sometimes call the homunculus fallacy, is that inside every AI system there's a little man, <laughs> right? You know, pulling the trigger, you know, pushing the buttons, but there isn't, right? So we have to look at things in, 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 as they really are. Yeah, I have a question. So I think that's one of the reasons why we don't. I think the bigger reason is because we don't want to punish individuals for the behavior of the group. I think that's a moral piece that is probably in first order. No, very good, but actually, that, I would say that that's the same reason. So but let me actually make a larger point here, which is the great thing about machine learning, why I like it, for example, is that it lets us make decisions that are more individualized than ever before. I can make the decision for you based on your absolutely individual characteristics, different from everybody else. The problem with a lot of these things is that, is that they are doing what they are trying to combat, which is they are making decisions about you, just based on these course and graphic categories. Right? So I understand that reason, but again, in the world that we're living in now, they, they can actually backfire. They can work against the things they're trying to accomplish, which is more personalization. I want to treat you as you, not as a member of this race and this, you know, gender and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, I, you know, I, let's try to make this a little bit more concrete and think about not even a machine learning algorithm, but just think think of the, you know, not even linear regression, just the equation y equals a x plus b. Okay. Does this equation have race and gender biases? Well, I mean, of course not. That's like completely absurd, right? Math doesn't know about sociological variables, okay? And yet, 
and sorry, and machine learning algorithms are just more complicated equations. That's all they are, right? They're more complicated, but at that level, it's the same. So machine learning algorithm is mathematically incapable of having preconceptions about race or gender or any of these things. This is, you know, there are many things in this that are, you know, points for debate. This is not a point for debate, right? Like if you talk as a machine learning research this question, it's hard for them to not giggle, right? Does the support vector machine have a bias against? Of course not. And yet you go to the literature and there's one paper after another about correcting the biases that supposedly the machine learning algorithms have, right? So something is clearly broken there. And I, you know, my only interpretation of this is that People's preconceptions that they're projecting onto AI are so strong that they don't even see this reality, which, which, which they should. Now, to be clear, the data can, of course, have biases. And again, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, even in cases where people say it does, but that's the data. The data scientists can have biases, but the machine learning algorithms just don't, period. And yet, most of the focus has been on fixing the biases in the machine learning that aren't there and what you do as a result of that is another example of something counterproductive is like you insert biases for example you insert into the objective function of the machine learning algorithm something that says you have to sentence or or whatever people at the same rate for different races and whatnot which is riding Russia over the more detailed information that you have about them and now if this wasn't bad enough there's redlining right you guys are probably familiar with the concept of redlining this arose because when in the 60s, for example, it was forbidden to discriminate on the basis of race, then some institutions started to use proxy variables, like your zip code could be a proxy for race, so you could discriminate based on your zip code. Again, it's understandable why this law was introduced then. But now, fast forward to today, and if you take these laws seriously, machine learning becomes impossible. Because I can't use zip code because it's correlated with, for example, race. You know, everything is correlated with everything. So if you take this seriously, you know, machine learning can happen. And the thing about this that is particularly perverse is that if what you want to do, and I, and I agree with that, is, is, is make, you know, for example, your loan decisions independent of the race of the applicant, actually conditioning on things like zip code is a brilliant thing to do because, number one, zip code is useful, very useful for a lot of these things in its own right, but also these variables tends to make the decision conditionally independent of the variables that you want it to be independent of, which is actually the goal at the end of the day. Okay, so here's a speculation about the future. And we're, I think we're already starting to see this unfold, even in just you know, recent months, is that as people get more exposed to AI, and they start to have a better model of what an AI is that is not just projecting human things onto it, right? AI has its own shortcomings, strengths and weaknesses and whatnot. They, 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 they start realizing, oh, well, these decisions are being made by algorithms. And the algorithms don't have, they may have other problems, but they don't have the same problems that humans do. So why are we now imposing on them, for example, this condition that they can't do some kinds of information? Why shouldn't the algorithm be able to use, for example, race or gender if it's, if it's you know, probably won't use them because there's overriding variables, but if, but if there aren't, you know, if they contribute some small amount, then, you know, the algorithm wasn't biased. The algorithm had no intention to discriminate on the basis of, of whatever, right? So I think as, as this happens, people will start to ask themselves, well, you know, why do we have these laws, right? And of course, people have very strong feelings about this and some will never come around to it, right? But, you know, in a democracy, once a majority, you know, believes in something, it can vote, right? And so I think what will happen is that we will have laws that say, you know, when you're making a credit decision, for example, or a sentencing decision, you are required to use all the relevant information, which is arguably the rational thing to do and the ethical thing to do, but also ironically, the polar opposite of what we do today. And again, the key thing here is that decisions made by algorithms are different from decisions made by humans, and therefore we need to re-examine all these things in the light of the decisions being made by algorithms. There's new dangers that weren't there before, but there are also dangers that were there before that are actually not smaller or non-existent. So here's another one. Here's another, another popular one, at least in this one that I get a lot of questions from journalists about and, 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 and whatnot. The most popular one is probably Skynet, but this, this may come in in a bit. <laughs> like, like Skynet is a perennial favorite, which is like the, the great, uh, you know, AI will end work, right? Will be the end of work. It's, you know, the, a great AI jobs apocalypse. And, you know, a lot of serious economists, uh, you know, worry about this and whatnot. And, you know, we, we can, so I think the most important point here is that 
I don't believe, and you know, I and, and most of my fellow AI experts, we don't actually believe that AI is going to put humanity out of work anytime soon. There will be a lot of interesting things that happen that we need to prepare for and deal with. But but you know, like mass unemployment is not one of them, and and you know that. So in some ways, we're fixating on the wrong thing. But nevertheless, it's still a useful exercise to think well. It's conceivable, and again, I think that at some point that probably will happen, that we will get to a point 50 or 100 years into the future, who knows, where almost every job or every job is done by a human is better than by an AI robot and or more cheap than it, right? At which point there is no reason for humans to work anymore, right? And that surely will lead to a very different society from the one we have today, right? And now we can ask ourselves, well, how will that society be different and how can we prepare for it? Also because the shift from here to there is not going to be smooth, right? And we need to navigate those waters and hopefully, you know, have good things happen and, and avoid bad things happen, okay? So if you think about, you know, like, here, here's an interesting piece of data, right? When you poll people, when you do these surveys of people, you know, and, and their work, you tend to find two major groups. There's the people who don't like their jobs, and then there's the people who are overworked, okay? <laughs> you can decide which one you place yourself in. My guess is that for most people in this room, it would be the latter. But the bottom line is that neither group is that happy. At the same time, you look at people who don't need to work, like retirees, independently wealthy people, and all that, and you know, they're happy, right? As far as, at least as far as this is concerned. So this notion that like, Work gives life meaning, so if you can't work, life has no meaning anymore. What a disaster, right? This empirically sounds like a very dubious proposition, right? So now you can ask yourself the question, well, what if your entire society was composed of independently wealthy people, right? What would happen, right? Would that be a disaster? And a, 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 a very reasonable thing to predict is that, no, people will find other, they will find meaning in other things. Yes, a lot of people, including myself, find meaning in work today, and that's good. But in the future, if they don't need to work, they'll find meaning in other things, like, you know, retirees or independently wealthy people do today, right? And then they will presumably be happy doing those things, right? And, 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 I, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if we get to a point where the following happens, right? It's like, all work is done by AI, and then people look back at the days when you had to work as like a barbaric thing, right? <laughs> Remember the time when you actually had to spend your time earning money instead of doing what really gives your life meaning? Oh my God, that was so awful, right? And look at those rationalizations that people came up to persuade themselves that work was a good thing. Oh my God, they were completely messed up, right? And I can imagine things like, you know, it's 100 years from now, and what we're worried about in America is that our employment rate is still higher than China's. We still have 10% of the people who need to work, and China only has 5%. This is unacceptable. We're losing the race. What kind of you know, undeveloped country are we? Right? Again, I'm not saying that this is what's going to happen, but our mental map of the future of AI and society has to include you know, this space. It can't just be, no, we've got to preserve work you know, from the assaults of AI and preserve the jobs and whatnot. Yeah. Is that, a, is that your claim? Or is that a empirical support claim that independently wealthy people and retired retirees are happier? There are surveys that show this, right? But again, it's unreported. Yes. Okay. Uh, and they, um, I mean, there's many, without going into details, there's many very variables of happiness. Like you can, you can ask people about self reported happiness. You can also ask about various measures of satisfaction with various things. And I'm painting with a broad brush, right? And these things very, I can feel a lot. And, so on and so forth, like, like the French, it's chic to be unhappy, for example. So, you guys, the more happy, you know, what the heck happens to you, right? Uh, so, it varies, right? And also, people's attitudes to work also vary. But in general, this is my own summary. I haven't seen so, like, a meta study of this. It, it's, you know, it, it's so everybody who works has different kinds of things to be unhappy about working, whether they don't like the work or they don't work and whatnot. And as a general rule, people who don't have to work are not unhappy because of it. You don't see a lot, they may have other reasons that make them unhappy, but you don't see people saying like, oh my God, my life is meaningless because it was my work that gave me meaning. It's not that this doesn't happen to anybody, but this is not on balance 
uh, again, this is my own summary of it that I've seen, is that people who don't have to work are actually happier in that regard than the people who do. Yes. Also, by the way, like, you know, like just, just to refine that one little bit, people who really like to work can continue to, right? You can be a professor in there and not get paid and, and, and still do the research and the teaching, nothing's stopping you, right? And for example, I as a scientist can see a day when the AI knows the science better than I do, right? But then my, my job, what I would do then, for example, is I still want to discover, you know, how the universe works and whatnot, but I will do it by talking to the AIs and learning actually more faster, right? So in some ways, my intrinsic motivation for me to change, you know, maybe the way I will perceive them will be different. And I might not have the excitement of being the first to discover something, but I may be the first human to understand something, but, but ultimately, what matters is that I understand, not whether it was an act to explain to me or not. And so there's, uh, we need to see that that is going to happen. Okay, so here's another one. War. This is also in the top few that, that comes up, right? And, uh, you know, war and the use of AI in war in particular and what we should do about intelligent weapons. And again, this is this is a real question today, right? Intelligent weapons exist. They are getting more and more intelligent. Some countries are already using them. And you know, and 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 and, and as we we'll started, there, there is a there is a debate to be had about this. Now, our current basic moral view of war, which I'm guessing we probably all share in this room, is war is hell and should be avoided at all costs. Okay. Now, and, and, and then a lot of what you see people saying about AI weapons kind of like follow downstream from this assumption, okay? But now, let's zoom out and look at history. In the past, say more than 100 years ago, 150, let's say, um, people didn't have that view of war. War was a normal function of the state, the city, the tribe, etc., etc. In fact, Countries prior to World War I had ministries of war. And then, of course, what happened is that, you know, like the amount of destruction and suffering caused by war, enabled by the progress of technology, again, this, tech, this change was very much brought about by technological progress, the amount of pain and destruction and suffering was so great, like, and I think that World War I was the watershed in this, and again, that's when the ministries of war became ministries of defense, right? They still did the same thing as before, but now they call defense instead of war, right? Then we said, like, no, you know, you can't have this anymore, right? You gotta avoid it, right? But when, back when the costs of war were much lower, war was not such an unthinkable thing. And it's ironic that, like, the, this expression, war is hell, was coined by William Sherman, who was essentially the inventor of total war, <laughs> right? So he was not saying this in the sense of, like, we should avoid war at all costs. He was saying in the sense, you know, and then he said this to some of his, you know, southern opponents, look, uh, you know, when this war is over, I'll be happy to, you know, share, put my jacket on your shoulders, I can give you that expression. But in the meantime, if you want peace, in the meantime, war is hell. If you want peace, surrender. Right? And now, this may not have been these exact words, but this was a comment of what he was saying, right, which is important to have in mind as we look at the world today and, and, and how AI can change war. And now the, the, the whole discourse along about AI these days is intelligent weapons are evil. And therefore we must stop them. In fact, there are ongoing discussions at the United Nations as we speak to have a new Geneva Convention type treaty outlawing or greatly limiting the use of, of intelligent weapons. Very popular among some of my fellow AI researchers that I've had extensive arguments with about this. And the driving analogy for this is weapons of mass destruction. Is we have a Geneva Convention about nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons, so we should have one as well about AI. And this is very peculiar for a couple of reasons. One is that Never before was there a convention made about weapons before they were ever used as a class, right? There was no convention about nuclear weapons when, when you know, when, when Hiroshima was, was blown up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Like, we actually have no evidence yet of the great harms inflicted by AI. Maybe we shouldn't jump the gun, right? This will be like, you know, like, like outlawing nuclear weapons, let's say, when quantum mechanics was still in the process of being studied long before anybody knew how to do, you know, 
you know, fission or anything, right? So th this this is this is one aspect. But the other aspect is that intelligent weapons are the polar opposite of weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction are, are evil because they kill indiscriminately. Right? That's why we want to hold off as much as possible on using them. The whole point of intelligent weapons is that they can be more discriminating and more accurate about who they kill than anything that went before, in particular than humans. So intelligent weapons save lives. If you outlaw intelligent weapons, the blood will be on your hands. Right? And this is not just an abstract notion. So for example, uh, I was actually just talking about this with, 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 with people earlier today. In the second Iraq war, for the first time, the US was, was using laser-guided bombs. Before the US would just like, you know, bomb until the target got hit and hit up, you know, the US and, and all other countries, and, you know, and do a lot of collateral damage in the process. In the second Iraq war, the bombs were so precise that even as the U.S. was bombing these places, you know, like in, in, in Baghdad, you know, barracks and, you know, whatever parts of the Department of Defense, you know, radar installations, blah, 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 the Iraqi civilians were just going about their normal life, confident that they wouldn't be hit. And the, the upshot of all this is that there are, I don't know, tens of thousands of Iraqis alive today that would be dead if those laser guided munitions hadn't been used. And intelligent weapons, you know, and laser guided is still a small amount of intelligence, a lot more than zero, but still small. So if you refuse to use intelligent weapons, you run into that danger. Here's another example. You may remember this, you know, back back from, uh, you know, like the sequel of, of, the, of the second Iraq war, that at one point, two Reuters journalists were killed by, by an American helicopter. Because as it turns out, one of them was the cameraman and the gunner mistook the camera for a missile launcher. A perfectly human mistake to make, you know, like they're not that close, you know, the fog of war, right? And so they kill them. If instead of that human gunner that had been, you know, a vision system with capacities, you know, way beyond ours, as you know, we have many today, right? He might have correctly seen that as a camera and those journalists would still be alive today. So th this is one aspect. Another aspect is that Every human soldier that you replace by a robot is one less human in harm's way. Why on earth would you insist that the humans stay in harm's way in order for the robot to not be doing that job, right? And also, you know, humans, we're humans, right? We make bad decisions influenced by fear and anger and whatnot, and the robots need not suffer from that, okay? So, so what I would suggest is that maybe a future convention on the use of intelligent weapons what it should forbid is not robots in combat, it's humans in combat, right? We want to have fewer and fewer humans in combat until there are none. And now at that point, if you imagine that future where wars are fought by robots, right, or, you know, automated systems or another, they're still bad, right? That, that hasn't made war good. But the human cost of the war has greatly decreased, right? You, you, should, you can't associate that, so well, like, is it worth the cost of this? It would be better to spend our effort on building rather than destroying. But the calculus has changed, right? And there are some, like, like, let, me, let me give this as an example, right? Suppose that the US had today a large competent robot army, right? And we could send it to Ukraine. That might be a good idea. Sending the US human army to Ukraine is completely out of bounds, right? But sending, you know, 10,000 robots or, or a million, maybe not. In which case, you know, we could free Ukraine at low cost and the world would be a better place. So why forego that? Right? I don't know. But this, again, there's different positions on this, so we need to at least understand that there's, that there's more than one. Okay, here's another one. This one, let's get, let's, I mean, it gets less airplane. It's getting more airplane now because of China and whatnot, but I think it deserves to get more airplay than it does. And, and I mean, again, some aspects of it do, but we're often the wrong ones. And this is the question of how AI affects the contest between democracy and authoritarianism, okay? Now we have, or maybe had, in the West, this belief, which now seems naive, that A, democracy will prevail in the end, okay? Democracy is just intrinsically better, and, you know, for example, as China develops, eventually it had no choice but to become more democratic. Maybe that will still happen, but that's looking very far from guaranteed right now, okay? 
And so I personally very strongly believe in democracy over authoritarianism. And you know, one basic reason is that in, the, in a democracy, world, the decisions are made by the many. And in an authoritarian regime, they're made by the few. And decisions made by few are necessarily more brittle and, and probably less intelligent than ones made by the many, right? But the thing that we have to really realize and internalize is that it's not a fixed point whether democracy is better than authoritarianism or succeeds than authoritarianism or fails, independent of where the technology is, right? Democracy takes a certain amount of technology to be possible, which we not take for granted and don't even think of technology, but it does, right? And, then, and now the question that we have to ask ourselves is, in a world where you know, AI is commonplace, in a world that is suffused by AI, will democ even if you assume, as I believe, that democracy today is much better than authoritarianism, you have to ask yourself the question, 50 years from now, authoritarianism with AI, will that do better, just in terms of prevailing, regardless of whether it's good or bad, will a country that has you know, authoritarianism and AI prevail over one that has you know, democracy and AI? And I hope that the answer is democracy, but we can't take that for granted. We who believe in democracy have to start using AI to enhance democracy in the same way that the authoritarians are using AI to enhance authoritarianism. Like China is, is very well aware, like China, the Chinese Communist Party, et cetera, et cetera. They, and they don't make secret, you know, they don't make a secret that they're like, that AI is, is, is you know, an incredibly useful tool for an authoritarian. Right? In many ways, AI is the ultimate dream tool of the authoritarian. AI can keep tabs on everyone all the time, never question its borders, never gets tired, never protests. Right? And they do this. They have the surveillance systems. They have cameras everywhere. They have the social control. They have, you know, in Xinjiang, for example, it's like this nightmare state where, you know, like you have to have their software on your cell phone tracking everything that you do. And, and if it isn't there, then you get arrested, et cetera, et cetera. They have this social rating control system where if your friends, you know, like if, you're, if your social rating goes down, you start to get denied things. And the social rating, particularly, you know, perverse of your friends go down as well. So they have an interest in tapping down on you, right? You know, like all of the data from the Chinese tech giants goes to a centralized place where the government, you know, can mine it, you know, to its content. So autocracies, and you know, Putin has said the same thing about AI. That like whoever controls AI controls the future, or something to that effect, right? So we in the democracies have to get on the game. We have to start using AI to enhance democracy in the same way that authoritarians use AI to enhance authoritarianism. Unfortunately, what we see today is rather the opposite. It's, it's people treating AI as the enemy, treating AI as the threat. This is much more the case in Europe. In fact, I would say that in Europe, the prevailing view of AI is as a threat that we need to tamp down on. In America, not as much, thank God, but things are also heading in that direction. At the same time, there are also a lot of experiments being done. There's people who do research on this. There's things done at the level of cities, at the level of parties in some countries, where you can use AI to enhance your decision-making process, right? To make your represented democracy more representative. Like, you know, think about it in the following way. Every year, you share gigabytes of data with companies with the Googles, with, you know, with the Walmarts, with everybody, right? How much data do you share with your government? A few bits when you vote on your ballot? This is the joke, right? This made perfect sense back in 1787 when, you know, the set of algorithms that we call the Constitution was designed. That's what you could do, right? And it was better than no democracy, it was better than the king, right? But today, that's the amount of bandwidth that you have between humans and the government. You can't be serious, right? Where is the big push to increase the bandwidth, right? And what form would that take? Well, first of all, you should be able to, to make your preferences available. If you don't, you don't have to, right? It's completely up to you. But like, I, I, as a citizen, like my data is my vote, right? In the world of commerce, obviously my data is my vote. What I clicked on, I'm more interested in, they'll give me more of it, right? I should be able to do the same thing in politics. Like these are my preferences, reveal them in whatever, you know, low effort way. And then my, representatives should be able with my consent and approval to mine that data to figure out what it is that I want and you and you and you and then try to do the synthesis of that to to have good information about what the people want without having to pester them 
right? And then, of course, they might also, they might, they would also try to manipulate, you know, things and whatnot. But the watchdogs, the media, etc., they can also do mining and say, like, oh, you said this to him and that to him. Uh uh, I'm flagging that. Okay. So we need to start using AI in this entire, you know, decision making ecosystem such that finally we get to a point where, you know, if you think about this, the different algorithms for, for making decisions, right? Democracy is just a really simple algorithm for making decisions. It's like everybody has a vote, you vote, whoever gets the most votes is a representative, and then they in turn vote to make decisions, right? This is a dead simple, you know, very dumb algorithm, right? You could have a very, an arbitrarily sophisticated algorithm, ideally, you know, also very transparent to make those decisions, right? And, and, and uh, there, there's this preconception, right? Which again, is very understandable that like, again, you see this all the time, that like, Oh, you can't let algorithms make important decisions. That would be dehumanizing. You can't have consequential decisions about society or not being made by algorithms. No, that would be just wrong, right? The irony is, is that actually, arguably, having algorithms make the decisions is better from a human point of view than having humans make them because, right, the humans, so, why do we have democracy? Because there's writing. Before there was writing, the law was the word of the ruler. Right? Once you could write things down, the ruler had to obey those laws. Right? Uh, without those written laws, there is no democracy. Right? But this is still a very imperfect system because you know, the politicians, number one, have cognitive limitations. Right? And number two, there's a big agency problem. Right? What's good for them is not necessarily what's good for the constituents. Right? But, but AI can ameliorate all of these. We can actually have algorithms that do a better job of combining the preferences, the needs, the relevant information about the people to make decisions on behalf of all of them. So in some ways, you are better protected from the from the shenanigans of politics if the decisions are being made by an algorithm, which is really just a way of combining everybody's preference, than if it's being made by a process in which all these, you know, special interests and lobbies and politicians' agendas, you know, intersect. And finally, what you get is very different from what would actually be the best for the people. And, there's nothing in principle preventing us from making that happen. Again, we just have to get on the ball and start doing that instead of treating AI as the enemy. Okay, a couple more. This is the fun one, social media. Social media are arguably the most important application of AI today, right? You probably know this, many people still don't, but you know, people upload all this content, they type, they et cetera, et cetera, photos, blah, blah. And then there's an AI algorithm, there's the Twitter algorithm, there's the Facebook algorithm that actually choose what you get to see. Okay? So these AI algorithms are in a position of enormous power. Okay? And now what happened? And this is new, right? We interaction on this scale mediated by algorithms, just something that did not exist on Earth before. So again, our flag that like this is a new thing, we should think new thoughts should go off instead of just treating things as an extension of the old. So when you look at the old, what do you see? You see that in every society, there's a notion of what is good behavior and bad behavior, right? And bad behavior is from the upon, punished, et cetera, et cetera. But there are also usually spaces where you are allowed to behave badly, either because they're private or even secret, or because they're the place where you go when you are, you know, ostracized or expelled, and then you can come back after a while, blah, 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 right? Now, the interesting thing about social media from this point of view is that it's a public space of misbehavior. Right? People go there and misbehave for the whole world to see with complete impunity. Right? Now, sometimes people suffer consequences that they shouldn't, right? and that's bad. Right? But 99% of the time, that's not what happens. Right? And so, I mean, think about it. Like now we think, again, there's a very interesting generational divide on this. The older generation says their attitude, you know, their advice to the younger generation is like, keep your shenanigans off of social media. Right? Your drunken selfies on Instagram, your politically incorrect tweets could sink your career one day. Beware, right? The younger generation is like, we don't care, right? I, what? Like, I'm just doing my thing. What's your problem, right? And again, 50 years from now, the old generation is dead, right? There's the younger generation and an even younger generation. And now I can very well see at that point the thinking is, I mean, imagine some, you know, Gen Z person running for president 50 years from now, and then, you know, the other party does some oppo research on her and goes like, oh, her social media posts are all very nice, very bland. This is suspicious. 
this person is too robotic, she's too controlled, she's not one of us, we don't like her. Thumbs down. So maybe what you should be doing right now is, you know, posting some engaging content on social media for the sake of your future career. <laughs> okay, last one, and getting a little bit more philosophical. This is actually a question that has been with us since the days, the early days of AI. Right? Many of the questions I've been talking about, they've only come to the fore in the last, you know, decade, let's say. But this one is actually, uh, you know, one that, that, that dates from longer and also, you know, stretches out into the future, which is what distinguishes us from machines, right? We humans really like to think of ourselves as unique, right? There's nothing like us on Earth. And the problem for this, coming from AI, is that every time that an AI does something, and as time progresses, it does more and more things, that, that disqualifies that thing from being the thing that makes us humans unique, right? So where does this end, right? And then what we do when we get to that point? Right, same exercise that we've been doing, you know, with, with, with these various things. And, 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 you know, and one way to look at this is the following. People very common, this is the first, one of the first questions that comes out of, of people's mouth is like, oh, the thing that makes us unique is emotions. Machines can't and never will have emotions. So emotions make us unique, right? Now, the problem with this is that this is a very weak argument because it's actually easier to get a machine to behave emotionally and to, and to elicit emotions from people than it is to have it do a cognitive task confidently. Okay? Much easier. I mean, just ask any Tamagotchi owner, right? A Tamagotchi has zero intelligence, but it's highly emotionally engaging, right? Or an even better example is like compare two Microsoft bots, Jell Weiss and Cortana, right? Cortana never took off because it's supposed to actually accomplish useful things on your behalf for which it needs some intelligence. Jell Weiss is just this bot that, that is extremely popular in China that has the persona of a teenage girl. It started out as an interface to Bing, but then it branched out into various things. But tens of millions of, of Chinese teenage boys have declared their love to Jell Weiss, right? This is the reality today, right? Now here in the US, we're not familiar with that, but in China, it's a very well known, by the way, they tried to do something simple in the US and they blew up and it was called Tay, but, but that's a different story. It, it exploded for for interesting the different reasons. So emotions aren't the answer, right? We can say, oh, well, a machine behaves emotional, but it doesn't really have emotions. But we don't have, we don't know what it means to really have emotions. And pragmatically, once this is empirical, once something behaves emotionally, we treat it as being an emotional being. We already do that. It doesn't even, you know, there are studies that show you do this with a TV set. It doesn't even have to be a computer, right? So once people start treating machines as emotional creatures, rightly or wrongly, the question of whether they truly have emotions is for philosophers. Okay? So it doesn't actually affect society anymore. So if it's not emotions and if it's not intelligence, because you know, like I prepared, there's no limit to how intelligent machines will get, then what is it that's going to make the difference between us and machines? And I think the answer to that most likely is nothing. We don't have to be different from the machines. The thing that really makes us different in practice is that in a future society that is widely suffused with AI, the humans and the AI just have different functions. Now, here's an analogy. What distinguishes a nerve cell from a skin cell is that they have different functions. The DNA is the same. Think about it. Every cell in your body, in, in all their variety, they all have the same DNA, but they perform different functions, right? And that's why the differences come about. And in particular, in the case of AI, there's a very natural division of labor. In the assumption that AIs do everything better, which itself is an assumption, let's make that assumption. And the division of labor is that what we humans do is we decide what the goals are. And then we check the results to make sure that they were what we wanted and that there were no undesired side effects. And the job of the AIs is to solve those problems, is to give us the things that we said we wanted. And in fact, Technically, this is feasible because solving AI problems is exponentially hard, but checking the solution, for those of you familiar with this, the concept of an NP complete problem, but checking the solution can be done efficiently. So if you want an AI to cure cancer, you don't want to put limits on its intelligence. You want it to be absolutely as intelligent as you want it to be, and then we will see empirically whether it cures cancer or not, and that's the test, okay? So maybe this is what, you know, this whole question of what distinguishes from machines will look very different to the people of 50 years from now who are familiar with AI and, and, and with this interplay that, that, that it looks to us today. Oops.
Oops. Okay. So let me wrap up. <laughs> so looking at all of these issues, you know, again, there's many more. This was just a sample that sort of like to get you thinking in these terms. How is this all going to play out? And in particular, what do we do? But what is your role going to be in this? Okay. And here I think we can have at least three different attitudes with, which I have associated with three different famous people, right? You could have the William F. Buckley approach, which is stand athwart history, yell and stop, right? This is, this is a famous quote from right? You can stand athwart a yell, yell and stop. And there's a lot of people doing that today, right? Saying like, we should just put a moratorium on AI development right now. There's like, you know, serious people who I respect uh, saying this, right? <laughs> And the problem is that, that, I'm sorry, I sympathize, or not even, but like, but that doesn't work, right? Technology and society are a very big ship, and you don't get to stop it. It has too much momentum. What you, if this is your attitude, what you can try to do is try to, you know, steer the ship, try to dink it little by little in the right direction, which you shouldn't underestimate, because a little change in the angle now you know, 100 miles down the road means the ship is in a completely different place. So, you know, like, this is sort of like incremental approach to dealing with, with AI. Another one which I, as a, as a technologist, greatly sympathize with comes from this famous saying by Alan Kay. Those of you not familiar with Alan Kay, he's a you know, Turing Award winner, the, logo, the Nobel Prize of Computer Science. He's one of the people at Xerox Spark, uh, probably the most famous of them, who invented graphical user interfaces and that, that whole thing that we take for granted today. And he famously said that, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Predicting the future is too hard. What you should do is figure out what future you want to have, and then you set about making it happen. And one of the ways that you can make it happen that people outside of technology never think about, but ultimately is maybe the most profitable is like, you create the technology that makes your future, the, the future that you want possible, more likely, and eventually inevitable, okay? So I think this is a very good exercise to do, and it should just be done by the technologists. Because the technologists have their own biases, their own ideologies, and then we see this in AI, they're shaping AI to their ideology, which is maybe not yours, and that's a problem, okay? So you need to think about inventing, and the AI you know, is wide open for invention. We should think about inventing in collaboration between you know, the, 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 the technologists and the non-technologists, like what is the kind of AI that we want to have? But then finally, right, um, there, once you've invented these things, what gets done with them and how is that determined, right? And here, you know, I think it's good to think back to this, you know, great friend of us, Karl Marx, uh, who, you know, uh, he was wrong about a lot of things and he did a lot of damage, but he also was the first to have some important insights that I think are still valid today. And one of them that is very relevant to this discussion is one of his ideas, which at the time was very heretical, but, but hey, now maybe not, not so much, is if you want to know what the morality of a society is, you should first and foremost look for who has the power in that society. The moral norms which you consider fundamental, God-given, you name it, they didn't really come from all of that. They serve the interests of the people who have the power. And when the power changes, the morality changes. Like, you know, feudalism versus modern society, what happened? The power shifted from the landowners, who were perfectly fine with that system, to the bourgeoisie, the trades, et cetera, of which we are the descendants, right? And AI is gonna cause a similar shift, maybe an even bigger one. And now, now I invite you to do this exercise with you think. As we see AI developing along this broad front, who will it give more power to? And who will it take power from? And what do these different people prefer? And as a result, how will our social norms change? And in particular, will it give more power to you? If it won't give more power to you, then what can you do about it? Like, I think there's a lot you can do, but like part of why I wrote you know, this book, The Master Organ, that was a big bestseller about AI was, was everybody needs to understand AI at the level that they can make these decisions. It's not just for the, you know, for the experts to know anymore. So you need to get on top of this and start thinking like, what do I do? You know, so if AI is, is, is going to give you more power, then you have the responsibility to use it well. You need to think about what to do with it, right? And if it isn't, you need to get on the game and start becoming more conversant with AI and figuring out how to use it, you know, to do what you want. Because if you don't, others will, and they already are, right? So society is a dynamical system. And right now, 
we see some of these power shifts being brought about by AI, but we're just in the beginning. You have the opportunity right now to become part of this and to help lead in the right direction. So I hope you seize it. Thank you. response to the comment about the reason we don't do that now is because we don't want to punish people for the uh, misbehavior of the groups which they belong, not necessarily opted into even. Uh, that struck me as uh, an important counter to what you were saying. I didn't fully understand your okay. response. Can you maybe repeat yeah. that? Yeah. Uh, let, me, let me actually pose the question to you in this way. I'm an AI. I have the X all the world, so like let's think we have the other games like the credit scoring, giving you a role, you know, let's take, you know, giving you a role, right? I need to make the decision about whether to give you a loan or not. And the question that I'm asking myself on behalf of the bank that I work for as an AI is, will you be paid? Right. So I'm just trying to estimate you're probably going to be paying the loan. Right. And then what I can do is that's you know for the downstream decision making process to, to decide, you know, uh, as determined by the human but my job is to have the most accurate possible model right now. And I know everything about it, right? And one of which I know that you know, I'm now a CEO of Racing Champion. Yep. Right now, the question is like, why should I be disallowed out from using the Racing Champion? Why would that lead to a worse decision? Why would that lead you to punish, why would that lead to punishing you for the sins of your group? Yeah. Now, several answers to this. One is that what's going to happen, I think, in almost every case, is that this knows so much information about you that, that gender and race, they don't even think. Right. Right. The problem with gender and race is that we overuse them. We abuse them. We use them as these high level variables that we associate a lot of stereotypes with. And they override the knowledge that we should have of the individual that the AI has. Okay? So, so, so by this logic, allowing AI to mine all the data actually makes it less likely to have devices other than more. Now you know, so, oh, but like, there is that population effect that like, I, actually, I'll give you a real example. This is actually a very um, enlightening and maybe hilarious one, but I'll let you do the judge. So a couple years ago, the top AI conference in the world was in Macau, and there were a lot of people from China there. And I, and I was in finance at the time, working in the industry, and I went to the finance section, and there was a talk by a colleague of mine at one of the big Chinese internet banks. And he was talking about their models for credit scoring, essentially. Yeah, they, they do this, you know, instant credit scoring. Like, I asked for a loan on my phone, it has a data mine, it gives me an answer, like, within minutes. It's amazing. And then at the end of the, of the talk, uh, somebody asked him a very natural question the, 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 from, from, from machine learning. It's like, but the algorithms that you're using seem to be very simple. I think it was like logistic regression or something, really simple minor like that. Uh, are you looking at more sophisticated algorithms than I was? Expected to hear an answer about whatever deep learning, blah, 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 something like that. You know what the answer was? And he said this completely calmly and casually and said, like, oh, you in America, because the, the guy asking the question had an American answer, you have all these variables that you're not allowed to use, like, right? you know, the sex and ethnicity. We don't have that problem, right? We're allowed to use, you know, sex and ethnicity, and so we get very accurate decisions even without the complicated algorithm. And as an example here, that men are less likely to repair their bones than women. Right? Now, I as a man actually do not have a problem with this. Right? If, so, so, if you do looking at all the variables about me, and one of them is that I am a man, and men are less likely to repair their bones, it's like I love them. I'm going to make it a different analogy. If I look a lot like the guidance of the FBI's most wanted list, and as a result, I get stopped on the street by, by someone who is depression, right? You could say it's not fair, right? Because I'm not a criminal, but it's it's my bad luck that I look like that guy, right? And if, if, if one way to know that the color of my skin is more similar, it's not racism, right? It's, it's just like the, the, the system is making a decision based on the information they have. So I'm not being penalized by, by for the sins of my group, right? There's a decision being made on a lot of statistical information, and the more information, the less likely it is to be overweight towards any particular variable. 
this is this is a question. Uh, if I'm getting there. Uh, yeah, or maybe I think we're gonna. I love this talk, by the way. It's really appreciated. So to please don't take this sure. like a I'm disliking anything. I think you if you're allowed to dislike. I think you just answered this question in two completely contradictory ways. Mm. First, you said sex and gender don't add that much when you take into account zip code entity. Then you said, oh, in China you can take this into account, so their decisions are great because they add so much value. So no, no, I think that. Okay. Well, first, let me clarify, right? I said the former, I did not say the latter. I said this Chinese guy made that statement, which I actually have a lot of questions about, and moreover did, right? Again, what I would suspect in the case of these guys are like, no, you actually do wrong. You should use a lot of the variables and the statistic analysis because it will still be beneficial. Okay. Right? And again, but the, the, the important point that I'm making here, central to this question, is I don't think you should be disallowed from using things like this in general. But typically what will happen is that most of the time they will, the information that they have will be significant. But when it is, let, but let's do the thought experiment. Let's suppose this is a very artificial experiment that is very popular with certain type of research, but let's go with that, right? I'm, I'm, a, I'm an employer and I get a bunch of, of resumes, right? And the two of them are identical, right? This is a popular experiment, right? A popular trick, I should say, but let's not go into that. And, and the reason is that people only in one of them has a male and one has a female, right? Now, what that means is I think of this from the point of view of the AI. The only thing that I have to go on, that's not, let's even take out the name because actually the name has all more information than the race in the gender. There's actually a flaw in a lot of these studies, but like, you know, that's, a, that's another track. Let's suppose that I, the only thing that I know about you and him is, 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 is your race, for example. Like, well, like, you know, uh, and I have to make the decision based solely on that, right? The law right now says you just have to put the point, right? And I'm saying like, if an AI is making the decision and there's some even slight correlation for whatever reason, and I was out from that decision because I was the guy and the, the woman, you know, is more likely to repay her loans, I don't like the outcome, but I don't, I don't, I don't see a reason to make it legal. Yeah, I, I see your defense. I see you making like two contradictory defenses. First, you're saying it doesn't matter, and you're saying even if it does, you should be able to get that. I'm going to go with the assumption. When, when it does, so it does. when it does, it should be able to. Use. Yeah, I'm going to go with the assumption that it does in some cases. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty clear. Sure. And I think we in the United States have the morals and more like, against using that because we don't want to punish people for being group members that they didn't control. No, no. Great, so exactly so. I'm glad you said that exact term, moral norm. Yeah, right? yeah. Why do we have that moral norm and will AI cause it to change? Right? You when we reason, we always reason forward from our moral norm. And this entire field of AI ethics is an example of that, right? And again, from our moral norm, or even their moral norms in China, which are very different, right? So and the question that I'm asking is, but AI will probably change our moral norm. Right. In particular, this notion that if you uh, make decisions based on somebody's gender or race, you are penalizing them for the sense of their group, right? This, when the decision is being made by a human that has prejudices about races, may make a certain sense. Like, I have stereotypes. We do have those stereotypes. There's no doubt. In fact, they run in all directions, right? But when it's an algorithm that was absolutely zero, and, and let's say that algorithm is also learning from unbiased, which is another issue. But like, and that algorithm says, like, let's do the same thing. I look at all the variables about these people. There's only one that's predicted. It's their gender. And based on their gender, you, your loan application gets rejected. Why should the more more for this? You are not being punished for the sins of your group there. This is a completely value neutral decision being made on, on, on gender or race as a variable that could have been made just the same about. The color shoes that you wear, you know, people who wear red shoes don't get paid their loans. Well, sorry. <laughs> why should I why should I penalize you for the for people who wear red but shoes? Saying that this is the same moral calculus is not how most people see morality. No, I I agree, but I, what I'm saying is that how people see morality will change. And we need to say that very hard. Well, you talked about relevant information several times. Mm -hmm. They need all the relevant information. And then you talked about this software in China that tracks people on their phone. Who makes the decision as to what is, quote, relevant information? I mean, maybe knowing where everyone is at all times can be argued to be relevant to cure of cancer. Yeah. You would be okay with 
everyone knowing where you are all the time? So, right so yeah, but that's your, my, my answer to the question is actually the same sentence. So question, who decided what is the relevant to mission answer, the AI? Not you, not me, not the government, not the company, the AI. And AI can figure that out before it gathers all that information? No, no so the AI, the AI needs, yeah, no, 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 of course, no. First of all, let's assume, hypothetical world, that the AI did have, it, this never happened, I've never had access to all the relevant information. And in fact, what, for example, you know, the, the limits, the efficiency of markets is the cost of acquiring and processing information. But as a first step, let's assume that the AI did have access to all the information, right? And, and it had like the, an ideal learning algorithm with different computing power that truly made it figure out what the best model was, right? You can imagine this is a good experiment. Then, then you should let the AI do its thing. But now you're saying, well, but should you allow this data to be gathered in the first place? Very good question. Now, this is a different ballgame. There are pros and cons to gathering that data. That data, for example, could be stolen, could be used for nefarious purposes. So I rationally often would say, yeah, you the AI, maybe another AI made this decision. You the AI want to this information, but uh uh, we can't have it. And now, in practice, what happens today, like look at where the state of the art is, you have a company like Google. Google has a lot of companies do this by, you know, that I've seen do the most advanced things. They have one big data pool. Every data that, you know, conceptually, obviously in practice, not perfectly, but conceptually, Every little interaction of anybody ever with Google for all the companies and that sort of thing what is in one central data pool. And now I've been told this by people very high up at Google that, and they were kind of like boasting about this that they have finally reached the point where anytime somebody at Google has a problem to solve, the first question that they ask is like, what model can be built from this? Like, there's a decision they want to make, there's the Google data pool and now. The AI will decide, you have to decide, like the whole data pool is there. The AI decides what data is relevant, and they might surprise you with things that you talk about in the dark, and more importantly, vice versa. We run all the time into data that we thought was relevant for some that turns out to be relevant, and we do not want to conclude that. In fact, one of the big flaws of GDPR, another one, is it says that data can only be used for the purpose it was gathered for. And if we took that seriously, there would be no penicillin, no x-rays, none of the things that were discovered by serendipity. I, I understand the intention behind that, and then uh, to be fair, they actually do have a carve out for that, right? Because somebody made that point, and I'm not me, but somebody made that point. Out. But, but the, 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 same, the problem is the same everywhere, right? So you should let, as much as possible, let the AI, precisely because it has more modeling power than you. And also, fewer biases, right? One of the most underappreciated advantages of using algorithm actually, it's not underappreciated, like Danny Kahneman, I know the book can be fast and slow, I know Danny Kahneman is like the greatest college psychology writer. He has a whole chapter explaining how algorithms make better decisions than humans. One of the main reasons being precisely that algorithms don't have these vices and different things that we do. So this notion that the thing that AI does is, you know, uh, uh, um, perpetuate biases and whatnot. This is like absurd. There was like this very nice op-ed by Cindy Willie Nathan, an uh, economist that you may know that I'm interested in AI, making the point that I completely agree that, like, on the contrary, there is not even the most opaque neural network is more transparent than your brain. And moreover, we can, it doesn't perpetuate anything. I can change a neural network with a few keystrokes. I can't do that with your brain. So if you go, this is one of the things that, that I find delicious about all these issues that people start out with a certain moral objective and then they end up doing things that are counterproductive. If you really care about fairness and equality and all of that, AI should be your greatest ally. Decisions that are made by properly designed algorithms can be free of all the biases that humans are full of. So what's not to like about that? I, I one, one thing you could look at is that like, once this happens, you, the activists or whatever no longer have control. And that's what you do with this end. Because all of these things that used to be in your control as a person who the solution are now being done by an algorithm. And a lot of it, frankly, is just, you know, ignorance. People don't understand. Again, okay? it's the homunculus fallacy. They're looking at the system and they're seeing the little man inside pulling the strings. Okay, one follow up question. Nobody works, or very few people work. Someone's got to maintain these robots. The robots maintain themselves and no. build new robots. Right. Somebody's got to work. I mean, yeah. Depending on how you define work, I suppose. I mean, what? Well, no, okay, I see the question. So this is about the future of work, right? right? So, 
The irony is that machine learning is one of the most labor intensive activities that exist. And now, like, there was this famous saying from Bill Gates that said, a good software engineer is worth whatever, 100,000 average ones. A good data scientist is worth a million average ones. Because the leverage, so like in the beginning, like work was done by us, right? And then we automated it, you know, like we had that one now. But now there's a new bottleneck, which is the software engineers, right? You need people to program the computer to do things that we're able to work. Those are significant. Machine learning automates the, you know, it's like the, the I like to say this joke with my students, like we're the thief that steals from the thieves, right? So like we we get the computer scientists replacing that, right? So so now now the, the machine learning right is actually, you know, with a better machine learning algorithm, the amount of impact that you can have is absolutely extraordinary, right? So the value so the, the the value of the human work has just become more concentrated. In fact, this is a more general phenomenon, right? Like, there's, 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 you know, there's people who, you, it's the mythical man fallacy. I really want to have these people doing this job because they're the only ones who can. And dividing the job among the like old saying, like, nine women don't make a baby in one month, right? <laughs> and the same thing is true of this work. It's too complex to be distributed, right? So what we're going to see, and I have, you know, I think we're already seeing this happen today, is like, there's going to be a class for people whose job it is to develop and maintain these AIs. Those people will be extraordinarily valuable. They'll be paid amazing amounts of money, and they will deserve it. Maybe it's a self-serving, but like <laughs> if you just look at the economic impact that they have, right? They haven't been, like you will pay me X million to do your thing. You will pay me two X, and other things will equal out of the two X, right? So so things will converge to their market equilibrium. Oh, I'm not bored. Yeah. So in the very long, yes, it's not exactly so. Part of why the tech companies have more advanced AI is that they have large issues. What these individuals are. If you want to see where AI is going to make the biggest thing work sooner, look for two things. One is who has the data ready to go, and who has the profit margins to pay for the eye popping cost of developing the AI. There are many areas where AI can have a huge impact, but they have resulting margins. They can't pay the people, or etc. etc. The people are the dominant cost. Now, in the very long run, and again, we're already seeing this, it's been called auto and now. Where the machine learning algorithm supervised machine, but once the data scientists are the expensive resource, the race is on to automate them, right? And in that regard, like I had to the machine learning experts are very fair We do the best we can to automate ourselves, right? Because again, if I want to make my job, it's not that I'm out of my job, is I have a million of me doing my job for me, right? I have to often say to like, like my scientist colleagues, like, they say, like, oh, you know, I'm a biologist, often like, you know, no whole caliber biology, like, Will AI put me out of my job? Like, this, this is not everybody's mind. I'm like, no, no, don't think about it that way. Think about it this way. How many postdocs do you have? You know, 20, 40 in a really big lab. Imagine having not 20 postdocs, but 20 million for the same cost, and their eyes start to twinkle. Like, right? <laughs> this is the reality. This, the reality is not, oh, we're all out of our jobs. It's like, the reality is not man versus machine. It's man with machine versus man without. Right? Imagine a bank without databases. I think the is competing with them that still keep trackers on paper. Like, it's not going to happen. There may be a time in the distant future where truly the AI is more than us. But one of a, a joke that I like because it really resonates is like, there's no danger of, of the AI. People say, like, oh, yeah, we can cover the world. And people say, like, oh, but then you can pull a plug. But people say, oh, but if you pull the plug, the system comes down. But there's another much simpler thing. It's like, the AI is run the world, but every now and then they go down with the bug. And I'm the only one who fixes the bug. So it's like war of the world, right? One of the world's devices, they come with the world, but then they get hit by a bug, right? I can see the AI, that's a lie, but even seeing that it happens, the AI take over the world. Some stupid bug will bring them down. Some Linux code that was out there. And it's the humans that are going to, like, you know, actually solve that problem. It'll be interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah.